Hey everyone, I'm Davey and I am uh, the owner of a 2011 Lexus LX570. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance that you own one of those vehicles or have some type of interest in uh, modifying or working with those vehicles. So with that said, before I jump in and we look at the results of the different spacers and the lift, or excuse me, the droop that's achieved with that, um, let's talk a little bit about how I personally got here to this point. So like everybody else, I'm looking for additional uh, travel, I'm looking for additional lift, all those good things that go along with off-roading. When the Lexus LX600 was released in the States, I was optimistic that the Lexus LX600 shocks could be retrofitted onto the 570. Uh, I knew that those shocks were um, somewhat longer than uh, the 570 shocks. So this is an LX600 shock. It is longer. This is a front shock. Uh, it is longer, both compressed and extended. However, uh, what we discovered is the stroke of the shock, the actual travel, uh, is almost identical. So as far as just being able to gain, you know, instant gain like an extended travel shock, uh, that's not the case. Now, Obviously, there can still be benefit gained because it is a total longer overall length, but is changing this shock the best way to gain that down travel benefit versus spacers and, you know, other combinations. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the video. The other thing I will say with the front shock is this bushing is a different diameter, um, as is this width here and the width where this sits into the uh, mount on the lower control arm. So it would take uh, some modification to get this shock into the 570 and functioning. The hydraulic fitting is the same, so that's good. Uh, but you'd have to do some work on the bottom end. Um, so with that said, what we're going to look at in the video is a 10 millimeter spacer. We're going to start at at stock. So we're going to take the truck, uh, stock suspension. Now, disclaimer, my suspension is uh, a Tundra swap setup. So I have uh, Tundra upper and lower control arms as well as Tundra uh, CV shafts. So that may be marginal difference from a um, stock 570, uh, but it's going to be very similar. We're going to take a 10 millimeter spacer. This is a rear spacer. I don't have a front to show you because it's in the vehicle, um, but we're going to start with a 10 mil spacer, then a 24 millimeter spacer. This is an Amazon spacer that's actually sold as a lift, I believe an inch and a half lift for a Tundra. Um, we'll talk about why with an AHC vehicle uh, that that is not it's not an instant uh, lift like it is on a traditional uh, cold sprung suspension. And then we'll look at a combination of the two. What happens when we stack the 10 mil and the 24 mil, 34 mil total, and what those results are. Important as we watch this video, the lower sway bar, um, or the lower sway bar, the, the front sway bar is disconnected. Um, we've got the, the linkage disconnected there. We had previously checked that and the first limiting factor on the down travel is the shock itself. You've got about another inch and a half before the sway bar becomes the, the limiting factor. So any of these gains that we talk about that are under an inch and a half, you could do so without disconnecting or modifying that sway bar linkage. Anything over that, you're going to have to do something with the sway bar linkage as well. There are a few other caveats that will mention if you want to get those, uh, those big gains, those two to three inch uh, gains. So with that said, uh, let's look at the results. Okay, this is the LX570 with the stock uh, shock, stock spring. We do not have any spacer uh, installed in the assembly right now. And we're setting this as our zero point. And next we'll install the spacer, the 10 mil spacer and the larger spacer and then we'll see how that affects the uh, droop uh, because it's not going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. So let's try to figure out exactly what that is with each spacer. So we do have uh, 
the sway bar uh, disconnected right now, but the sway bar, uh, the shock is the limiting factor before the sway bar is the limiting factor. So that's not going to affect this equation. All right, so now we have the 10 millimeter spacer installed. And if we look here, we're just shy of three quarters of an inch. So 10 mil spacer, three quarters of an inch gained. So now we have the larger spacer installed, which I believe is a 24 millimeter spacer. And if we look, we're now right at an inch and a half gained over stock. Now we've got both of the spacers stacked in there sandwiched together. So that's 24 mil and 10 mil. So you've got 34 mil of total spacer. And we are just over two and a quarter. So what we've got is our two spacers in here for this experiment. Uh, we want to explain what that does on an AHC truck as opposed to a traditional coal sprung Land Cruiser uh, type suspension. So recognize that not only is the spring holding up the weight of the truck, but the shock is as well in an AHC system. They share the load. The shock is, is, is a spring as much as the spring is when it is loaded with the fluid. The ride height of the truck is all solely relative to the position of this sensor here, mounted on the side of the coal bucket, attached to the chassis. The ride height is always determined by what this sensor sees and how much fluid is pushed into that spring, effectively changing the spring, different, spring rate difference of the spring. So as we adjust this sensor, it's the same thing as going to a different spring or a longer spring on a traditional truck. With that being said, if we keep this sensor in the same position and add the spacer up here, the right height of the truck will not change because the upper control arm and thereby the whole control arm spindle geometry is going to stay the same. It's going to try to hold this same plane. If this level plane with my pointer here is where that nominal position is at right height, it's going to try to hold that with the truck and changing the fluid there. But what we have done is we will have pre-compressed the shock more. So the nominal length at nominal height is going to be shorter. So that is where you have the potential for more lift because you've pre-compressed that spring more. You can adjust or fabricate a longer mount here to adjust this sensor then so that your new ride height having this strut assembly at the same nominal length as it was before, we'll now end up with the chassis taller. So this part of the video is a splice. Uh, this is edited in after the fact because I got all the way through, put this video together and realized that we did not discuss uh, compression. We, we were just talking about the droop, which is the main point, uh, but we do need to talk about compression and what that trade-off is uh, when you start using these spacers. So back to our shock. When we put that spacer on top of the shock, what we are doing is we are essentially, as Andrew said, pre-compressing the shock. And that means there's less up travel, more down travel. So with that said, we need to make sure that when the truck is fully compressed, okay, when we come down hard and this goes up, that it does not bottom out beyond its intended point and damage the shock, especially with an AHC shock. So that's where your bump stops come into play. Now, on the LX570 and the LC200, you've got two of these bump stops. These are the stock OEM bump stops on the front um, above the lower control arm, right? 
But in the video that you'll see here in a second, where we discuss this, one of my bump stops has been replaced with a Timberin bump stop. There's also like a Sumo Spring, I believe is one of them, and some other manufacturers of a more uh, dynamic uh, bump stop that gives you a little softer compression. But nonetheless, the concept is still the same in that when we start putting these spacers in, as you'll see in the video, when we put the 10 millimeter spacer in, there's still a margin of safety over uh, a margin of safety so that we don't over compress the shock. Anything over 10 millimeter, it's going to be getting into a danger zone. And with that said, you will want to space your bump stops down in order to prevent that. And that's not going to be a very difficult uh, modification. But if you don't bring this down, then this is going to fully compress, over compress, and create issues. So that's what you're going to see here in the next couple of little clips is Andrew discussing first uh, the bump stops uh, at a 10 millimeter spacer in and then with a 24 millimeter spacer and why that is a little too much uh, without extending the bump stops. So what we've done now is we've removed the coil spring from the shock assembly. We have the sway bar still disconnected just to get everything out of our way. And we've collapsed the suspension as much as we can with the transmission jack. If you look very closely back here, I'll demonstrate. There's a slight, you can see the pocket scale, will fit between the bump stop and the A-arm. That is due to the Timberin bump stop on this side is compressed as much as we can. In a dynamic situation, we would probably have about another half an inch of compression based on the measurement here that we can see between the hard surface of the bump stop and the Aon. With that being said, up here, when this shock was out of the truck, fully collapsed, this rubber isolator was basically right on the top of the seal ring there. So now you can see we have about an inch and an eighth from the rubber isolator down. So subtracting our half an inch, we have about a half an inch, maybe five eighths on the high side of additional compression possible in the stock shocks with the setup of 10 millimeter extension on top of the top half. So what we've done as discussed, we have installed the thicker spacer that we had on top of the stock 570 shock. We've also, if you'll look back here in the back bump stop, we've removed the rear timber and bump stop for the moment so that we could compress all the way around to, onto the front remaining factory stop. There's two bump stops on the front to really get an idea of where it would hit. And you can see with the thicker bump stop, we are right at the bottom of the stroke of the shock to the point I don't think there's enough safety margin because this factory bump stop will compress about an eight to three sixteenths in a dynamic situation. Okay, so if you're still watching this video, uh, you're probably somewhat of a nerd like myself that spends way too much time and energy thinking about these trucks, thinking about how to gain just a little bit more of a performance edge in some form or fashion so that we can take them out in the woods and beat on them and break them and then rinse and repeat the process over and over. Uh, with that said, I'm just a guy sitting in my garage that likes to talk on the internet about uh, 200 series uh, trucks. Uh, my brother, who you did see there just for a moment at the prior clip, is a professional mechanical engineer who works uh, for a career in automotive design and manufacturing. So you can put a little more credit into what he has to say than what I offer. Uh, I appreciate you watching this far, and I hope we can continue this dialogue. I'll try to post some updates as I personally go forward and figure out what's going to be next on my truck, which I do think is probably going to be some combination around 30 millimeters or so of spacer in the front. I've got some ideas on how to achieve that uh, sway bar linkage uh, issue, uh, but we're going to have to figure out something on the CVs. So the traditional answer would be to do a diff drop, um, obviously on the front diff. With the way my skids are, uh, that's probably not 
ideal. So maybe that's how I could warrant like those RCV axles. I don't know. But uh, thanks again for watching.